friends and uh, dear brothers in Christ, good I would like to apologize again. Uh, you are going to bear with me today. The scheduled uh, title of my lecture is uh, Orthodox Psychotherapy and Western Psychology. Yeah, it is a basic teaching of the church that the uh, church is a hospital, a therapeutic center. We see this in many passages in the Holy Scripture. Uh, let me just remind of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, you know it very well, I don't need to elaborate on this. Human beings have uh, very many wounds and the Good Samaritan, Christ, is the one who takes him to the hospital, to the church. To see what the basic task of the church is, it is important to see uh, the beginning and the last things about mankind. Saint John of Damascus says that when man was created by God, he was in continuous communicate communion with God. His nose was bright, open, illumined, and uh, could see the glory of the Holy Trinity and the angels. That is, uh, he was in a state of illumination of the nose and the vision of God. But uh, he needed to develop further and uh, stabilize in this state. In patristic tradition, there are two interpretations so, about the state of Adam and Eve before the fall. The first is that uh, man was in a state of illumination and uh, continuous prayer, and the second that he had the vision of God. In St. John of Damascus' book, Exact Exposition of Orthodox Faith, uh, we see both traditions. What is important is that Adam and Eve lived in a very blessed state in paradise. After they committed sin, they lost the illumination of the news and the news was darkened. It became blind and could not see the light of God, the glory of God. So passions dominated inside his soul and his body. And this is what the ancestral sin is that uh, man lost contact with the light of God. Uh, we see this in a passage by St. Paul who says all have sinned and all are deprived of the glory of God. The glory of God is uh, God's light. So they reached a point where they could not see the light of God. So many fathers refer to it as the darkening of the nose, as the blackening of God's image inside man. This is why the cleansing of the heart is needed, so as to progress to illumination of the nose and to deification. Father John Romanidis uh, realized this very well, and this is why his first uh, major study was on the ancestral sin. The ancestral sin was not simply a disobedience to God's commandment, nor simply guilt which entered man's life. What it is, is that man lost communion with the light of God. So the church's goal is to take him from the fallen state and cleanse his heart and so that he reaches a pre-fallen state of illumination of the nose and then lead him to the vision of God. We can see this from the last days of man. Uh, 21 years ago, around this time, I was in Vancouver and Seattle. I was still an Archman right at that time, and I was together with uh, Father John Romanidis for a conference. And I was informed, uh, got a call from Athens, that I should return back uh, because I'm about to be elected a bishop. There is a photograph from that time uh, with me speaking with uh, Father John Romanidis. I told him, Father John, I must leave for Greece because in a few days I'm going to be elected as a metropolitan. He expressed neither joy nor congratulations. He told me, you should know one thing, what the church's goal is, why you will become a bishop. You should know that all people will appear in front of Christ during the second coming. The righteous ones will see him as light and the sinners as fire. <coughs> From God's throne there flows both the light that illuminates the just ones and the fire that burns the sinners. God will love all people and he will send his grace to all people, both uh, righteous and unrighteous. People, depending on their own state, on whether they are cured or not, will see God as light or as fire. 
This is something that all fathers say. Uh, St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory, St. Gregory Palamas. It was not uh, Father John, John Romanidis' theory. And he continued <coughs> saying that you should understand and tell other bishops that the church is a hospital. The church is not a travel office is printing uh, tickets for a nice journey, uh, not printing tickets for people to go to paradise. The church cures people so that when they see God, they see him as light and not as fire. Light has two characteristics. One is illuminating and the other is burning. We must sense God as light and not as fire. In order to see him as light, we have to acquire a spiritual eye. If one doesn't have spiritual eyes, he will see it as a fire and not as a light. Saint Nicholas Cavasila says this very clearly in his first homily on uh, the life of Christ. He says that at that point God will come as light, but uh, he will be seen only by those who have spiritual eyes. And Cavasila says that the church is the laboratory which helps us acquire spiritual eyes. So the state of Adam before the fall and the state of the last things show what the purpose of the church is. Of course, the church has other tasks too. It deals with the uh, human body, it deals with social work, but its main purpose is man therapy. Thirty years ago, I wrote this book, uh, Orthodox Psychotherapy. In the sense, and I gave it this uh, meaning, this interpretation that the church cures the entire man, not only the soul, but also, by extension, the body. Church is a laboratory, laboratory of sainthood. And as Father John Romanidis would say, the Church is a laboratory to produce relics. That is, the grace of God through the soul <coughs> is transferred to the body too, and so we have the, the, the body sanctified and we have the relics. Uh, it was remarkable that the American Psychological Association issued a, a, a manual on uh, psychotherapy and religious diversity, uh, which presented the therapeutic material existing in all uh, religions and uh, denominations, so that it could recommend to psychologists in America to uh, make use of the therapeutic material in its uh, religion. And the chapter on Orthodox, uh, uh, the, on therapy for Orthodox Christians, accepts these terms psychotherapy and uses these terms Orthodox psychotherapy. And uh, there it has a, a very important, I think, uh, very brief summary of my book. It says that the Orthodox Church cures uh, the soul of man, it cures uh, the passions of man. It presents my name too, uh, saying that uh, I'm an Orthodox psychotherapist who offers this material to all people. And it states that the Jesus prayer has the same results with some medicine that uh, people take to calm, calming, calming medicine. This means that uh, a lot of people uh, see the neptic tradition of the church nowadays and of course the neptic tradition is very closely connected with the entire life of the church and the holy sacraments there must be a connection between the sacraments and the ascetic orthodox tradition and what follows i will present you 10 basic principles of this orthodox psychotherapy the first principle is that uh, illness is an unnatural movement of the soul's faculties Sin should not be viewed in uh, legalistic or moralistic terms, but in uh, medical terms. When God created man, he put all the faculties of the soul and the body so that they are oriented towards God. St. Nicholas Cavasila says that we have received reason in, or in order to think of God and desire in order to desire God. And we have received anger so that we are powerful in uh, turning toward God, who is, the, who is our, our loved one. 
It's like making a rocket uh, which is launched and uh, it goes, uh, it is launched and goes uh, in the atmosphere and then starts revolving around Earth. Rocket is not made to just wander around in the streets. It is made to go farther high up and to overcome uh, gravity. This is an example to show how man was created by God. After sin was committed, all three faculties of the soul, the rational, the desiring, and the insensitive, became sick. Before com the commitment of sin, there was a movement in a natural or a, a supernatural way, but now it has become unnatural. Instead, instead of being uh, oriented towards God, the faculties of the soul are now turned against God, and are turned in uh, nature and uh, make an idol of nature. Christ is the new and last Adam who came in to correct the uh, mistake of the first Adam. And so in Christ these faculties of the soul are cured and are now turned towards God again. It's uh, what Christ said, you shall uh, love your neighbor like yourself uh, in Christ, man is turned from unnatural uh, way of behaving to the natural and to the above nature, supernatural. The second therapeutic principle. Within the church and with all the means that uh, the church uh, has at its disposal, uh, self-love is cured and it becomes uh, love for God and love for fellow human beings. Uh, in referring to self-love, St. Maximus the Confessor calls it the irrational love of the body. When we love our body excessively, then all the powers of the soul are oriented towards our body. So, someone who loves himself cannot love God and the fellow human beings. St. Paul, in his hymn to love, says that uh, love does not know it her own but of the other persons. There are two types of love. One is uh, selfish and the other is unselfish. If uh, we examine ourselves uh, carefully, we will find out that we love ourselves more than the others. And uh, we lo when we love others, it's because we love ourselves. Many people would say, I love you, but in reality they mean, I love you, give me. Instead of saying, I love you, I give you. This is what Christ said on the cross. He said, I'm crucified and I love you. Uh, get, mothers would often ask their children, do you love me? And children reply, yeah, yes, I do. And mother asks, how much do you love me? And children open their arms and say, so much. So when we ask Christ, how much do you love me? He opened his arms on the cross and he said, that much I love you. So a basic principle of therapy is how to transform selfish love to unselfish love. I love God because I love Him, not because I wait for, to receive something from Him. Similarly, I love all others because I consider them as God's gifts to me. So I receive all creation as God's gifts to me, and I offer myself as a as a gift, as a gift back. We can see this in the family, within the family. Husband should uh, view his wife as God's gift to him, and the wife should uh, view her husband as God's gift to her. So their love is a mutual exchange of gifts, and there must be unselfishness in this love. The third basic principle is the healing of the rational, desiring, and insensitive parts of the soul. We know that this division of the soul in three parts, rational, uh, and desiring, and insensitive, was made first by Plato. Fathers accepted this uh, partition of the soul. Uh, when one commits sin, in reality, all three powers of the soul get sick. So therapy is needed. The rational part uh, gets sick with uh, many uh, bad thoughts. Sin starts with the rational part, the thoughts enter uh, on committing sin. Then the desiring part gets sick when one desires 
commits him, and then uh, he commits him and uh, the, with the insensitive part. So all three parts have been seen. The cure is to get rid of bad thoughts, to transform, to convert bad thoughts into good thoughts. This was one of the most fundamental teachings of uh, Saint uh, Paisios of the Holy Mountain. He used to say that uh, we should become a factory of good thoughts, so to, that is to convert bad, to transform bad thoughts into good thoughts. Uh, he himself, Saint Paisios, had uh, this uh, great charisma. We would go to see him and each one of us had uh, his own thoughts and immediately he would say something in cure. He was not a priest, he was not a confessor, but he had learned how to change these bad thoughts into good thoughts and to get rid of the bad thoughts. There are many nice examples of uh, in his life. One such uh, uh, incident I was telling his grace when I, we were coming here from New York. Someone went to talk to him and uh, Father Paisius gave him a lukumi, Turkish delight. And then a bee appeared and started flying over the lukumi. The visitor was scared and was trying to throw her away. Father Paisius told him, why do you kick her away? Do you know her? He was shocked and, uh, he, and Father Paisius told him, uh, do you want me to introduce you to her? <laughs> She's a small insect and she lives a very few years, but she does a great job. She loves people very much. She produces honey so that people eat it and uh, are sweetened. And then she makes the honeycomb and out of which uh, we make candles and we glorify God with them. So she loves uh, God and man very much. So the visitor replied, I, I'm afraid uh, she might uh, stink me. So Father Paisius stood up and uh, he brought some sugar in his hands. We went there and uh, sat on the sugar. And he got up and very carefully, so as not to bother her, went to the window and threw the sugar out, so the bee went out with the sugar. In a very good and very kind way towards an insect that uh, offers us a great service. This way, he transformed the way of thinking of his visitor. So a basic principle of psychotherapy is the curing of the rational and desiring and insensitive parts of the soul. The fourth basic principle of psychotherapy is the interconnection between pleasure and pain. According to the teaching of the fathers, when man was created by God, he did not have pleasure and pain in his body. He only had the pleasure in the soul so that he would be oriented towards God. But man, uh, this pleasure which was oriented towards God, they directed it towards the created things. So pleasure from, ple from the nose, mind, went to the body. And that's why God introduced suffering, pain, in order to cure uh, pleasure. Uh, St. Maximus the Confessor expounds this teaching very well. Uh, pain and suffering follow bodily pleasure. For example, one eats more than necessary and then uh, stomach pain, so that he learn, learns to eat less. St. Maximus the Confessor says pleasure was voluntary. Man on his own will turn towards pleasure. So God allows involuntary pain in order to heal pleasure. In general, people have a very bad relationship between uh, pain, pleasure and pain. For example, a young man uh, uh, likes to use it to experience his pleasure in taking drugs. After the influence of drugs is over, this will bring pain. So that he would like to have a more dose of the same, double dose of the drug. The double dose of the drug will bring double dose of pain and then he will, get, he will get into a triple dose of drug, a vicious circle is created. So therapy consists of reducing pleasure with self-restraint and take up voluntarily the pain of uh, asceticism in order to cure involuntary pain, sorry, in order to cure voluntary pleasure.
apologize for this mistake. Uh, fifth basic principle, the nose in relation to blameworthy and blameless passion. Uh, the nose is the finest uh, attention. It is something different from reason. For example, one may be driving a car and he, his reason is on how to drive. Uh, but his nose, his uh, inner attention is uh, on some uh, beloved person. Perhaps. This is the difference between reason and nose. Uh, blameless passions are the passions which are without sin. Hunger, thirst, sleep, they are called blameless and natural passions. These natural passions may be converted to a blameworthy passion. For example, hunger is a natural passion. When one eats more, too much, this becomes uh, indulgence in food. Thirst uh, is a natural passion, but when one drinks uh, too much, then it becomes a blameworthy passion. The noose is the one that the one that controls the passion so that they remain blameless and not turn into blameworthy. A noose which is uh, purified, illumined, and in prayer. Uh, knows how to control how much to eat and how much to do for these other things uh, and how to balance uh, these things. When the noose is impure, then even the blame, the natural passions become blameworthy passions. So we need the therapy of the noose, uh, which is achieved with uh, pure thought and prayer. When one prays continuously, he receives uh, grace from God and he controls the passions of the soul and body. It's like a horse rider in a coach who directs both the horses and the carriage. He, he is called deified, he is in the progress of uh, being uh, cured. All the members of the church are those who are being cured and at the same time the doctors are those who cure and are being cured themselves. No one is perfect, but we are all oriented towards perfection. And the last basic principle is that, as I said in the beginning, eternal life is related to therapy. We remain in the church so that we are cured, so that our uh, uh, powers of the soul are transformed and transfigured, and so we can see God as light. Unfortunately, I will not proceed to the second part. We don't have uh, time because of the translation. I had prepared something to tell you about uh, psychology, Western, uh, just a few words, and perhaps we can elaborate in the discussion. Scholastic theology was based on man's uh, reason. Protestants emphasize the external, emotional part of man. They both omitted a place which is in the heart. They don't deal with it, either of them. While the Orthodox tradition has this uh, native tradition, which, is, uh, which deals with man's heart and his passions. So there was a vacuum there, and uh, secular men tried to cover it with psychology and existentialism. Uh, before the 20th century, psychology was associated with philosophy. From the 20th century on, it was uh, dissociated, and there are various trends in psychology, behaviorism, cognitive psychology, which deals only with thoughts and emotions. And now we witness a revolution in psychology because uh, cognitive psychology is associated with neuroscience. They try to investigate what exactly happens in the brain and how this affects, affects the psychological uh, world. And that's when existentialist uh, psychology and philosophy developed, which deals with questions like what is life, what is death, why do I exist, what lies beyond death. It is important to say that uh, we are not against any effort to help people and cure people. When man is, lives in such an anxiety, he must find help somewhere. So both psychology and uh, neuroscience uh, help people to reach a certain balance, both psychologically and socially speaking. But we know very well that this cannot exhaust a whole human being because uh, men cannot be satisfied by this.
Orthodox theology offers mankind something more than this. Doesn't have them only to be balanced, but also to reach their natural life and to progress towards supernatural, natural, natural life and meet God. So there should be a cooperation between the clergy and the psychotherapists in order to help men as much as possible. I had a lot of things to tell you, but uh, because as you realize it's like having two lectures. <laughs> one in Greek and one in English. Uh, this requires uh, double time. I'll finish here. I don't know if we have uh, time for questions. Uh, if not, we can do it at some other point in time or even tomorrow. Your Eminence, thank you for your remarks. Uh, my question is, you mentioned at the beginning of your lecture that God is light and fire at the same time. Those who love God will see the light, and those who don't will see the fire. Uh, how does, if God can be both, uh, then how does that fire and light is imparted to those uh, who deserve that, so to speak. I think I gave some uh, further explanations on, on this, uh, both yesterday where I met with a small group and today. It is a teaching we encounter in St. Basil the Great and St. Gregory the Theologian and many others. The sun both illuminates and burns. The same sun, yes. God does not make any distinctions. He is not uh, favorable to some people. He doesn't love some people and hate other people. He told us to love our enemy, so how would it be possible for him not to love everyone? Uh, Saint Isaac, uh, Isaac the Syrian, says that hell is the, the, the weep of God. Of, of God's love, God's love. So paradise and hell do not exist from the point of view of God. They only exist from the point of view of man. And I think I gave an example yesterday in interpreting Saint Paul uh, in the Epistle to some, to the Romans about the mud and the candle. Uh, the mud is uh, hardened under the sun, and the candle. Uh, it becomes uh, liquid, softer and liquid. Nowadays we read uh, various texts by theologians and we see different views about paradise and hell. For example, some say that paradise is uh, absolute eudaimonism. Uh, this is a platonic view. Plato used to teach that man returns to the world of ideas which is absolute. Father John Romanidis used to say that what these people call the uh, paradise and absolute happiness for us it is hell. Others claim that hell is the absence of God. It is not the absence of God. God can never be absent from the whole creation. It is God's presence which is perceived by man as fire. Others think that uh, hell is a created fire. It is not created fire, it is an uncreated energy of God which acts in various ways. Cousin Zakist, an atheist Greek writer, uh, used to say that uh, when it's like having an elephant and when we touch one part of the elephant we say, okay, this is soft and another part, okay, this is hard. This is the same with God. God is soft or God is hard, depending on each one. We can view it in uh, human terms, everyday human terms too. A uh, little kid uh, does something bad and then uh, he's afraid and scared that his mother will punish him. But his mother loves him, it's the kid perceives this and is scared. God loves everyone and sends his grace to everyone. And the uh, grace acts differently depending on each one's state. Abba Dorotheos has a very good example to illustrate uh, what this is. This, if you close a man in a room without food, without water, and uh, not allowing him to sleep, 
this is hell, uh, not to be able to sleep, not to be able to eat. And then he explains that when man uh, is used to satisfy his passions, to satisfy his bodily passions with pleasure and satisfaction, that is, the desires of the soul are uh, satisfied by the body, then after death, uh, there are the desires of the soul that still exist, but there is no body to satisfy them, yeah. and so uh, this is suffering. This is why this transformation of the energies of the soul should uh, take place in this life, and we love God and man. So paradise and hell exist only from the point of view of man, not of God. And that's why we need therapy. To see God as light and not feel Him as fire. If someone is blind and cannot see, he receives only the burning property of light, not the illuminating one. Thank you.